name is Mar Haley Steele, and I'm an advanced research affiliate with the Humanities and Critical Code Studies Lab at USC. I've been doing that for a good two years now, working um, under the lab director, Mark Marino. Um, our work is to um, explore, create, and document emerging media forms. And uh, the creative methodologies that have sprouted up in the 10 years since critical code studies came into existence are uh, the annotation of code, and the, um, so that's like code as, a, as manuscript, and um, the, the, or code as, oh, I can't remember code as manuscript, code as document, it, the, the reading of code and the annotation of code. So, you know, it, it started with people looking at computer code, and uh, two years ago I had this crazy idea that certain kinds of LARP are actually what may be thought of as code that runs on humans. Um, so we, we started annotating some, um, some LARP code, and uh, that sort of led to this, this process of looking at mechanics in this, you know, uh, very different way. But um, in my discussion, uh, my, my talk on Thursday, um, I was looking at LARP literacy, and so this is sort of going into some of the mechanics that aren't all necessarily coding, you know, because it's, it's certain kinds of LARP that have LARP code. Um, so, um, this, this talk is about um, diegetic democracy in LARP design, techniques for distributing power over what we see. Um, and these are, these are notes, notes, towards, um, notes towards a paper. Um, so my, my goal is to be a little, you know, a little less formal and um, uh, kind of show some ideas that I'm, I'm in the midst of, um, of developing. And I'm, I'm really excited, you know, for folks who I know are designers in the room, you know, to, 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 uh, to give thoughts and feedback. Or if, you know, if I'm, you know, if you're like, no, that, that just doesn't make sense. Like, I want, I want to hear about it in the Q&A. So please, um, uh, I'm, I'm excited to make this more of a, a, uh, an experience of co-creating, uh, co-creating, uh, co-creating um, co things. So in this, in this talk, this is a discussion about um, power, about power over diegesis. How do we hold power over diegesis authorial in some media forms? And how might it be rendered aggregate? Um, this has been an interest of mine for quite a while since working on uh, aggregate LARPs in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, for this talk, I'm, I'm drawing from terminology from uh, narratology, semiotics, critical code studies, communication studies, media studies, and theories of decentralization. Um, I'll, I'm looking at three specific LARP styles and their mechanics. So the Pacific Northwest aggregate LARPs, some of which I worked on, uh, but also that, that I've been documenting, uh, working with their creators to, to document those styles of LARP. Um, some mechanics from Nordic freeform LARP, uh, very, you know, I'm, I'm really limiting it to about two mechanics, and some mechanics from Irvine GMless LARP. Um, so the, the central question um, I'm interested in, in looking at is how might these efforts to democratize power over diegesis in LARP be instructive to those interested in new and experimental forms of horizontal governance? So how might we take the ways that we co-create diegesis in LARP and use it to talk about other decision-making processes, um, which I argue, you know, in, in whether it's legislative or you know consensus processes or, or, uh, or whatever, you know, any decision-making process, you're creating a story. You're creating a story about the future. So how might we think of, you know, LARP as a media form that might be instructive to talking about how we distribute power in those other forms of decision-making? So <clears throat> towards a more Democratic medium. Um, you know, so, something that's very interesting to me about these two quotes is that they, they both were, they, they came out of 67. It, it was kind of interesting to take a moment and say, oh wow, this is right at the cusp of the sort of cultural revolutions we saw in the West um, in 68. The medium is the message. The birth of the reader must be ransomed by the death of the author. That's McLuhan, that's Roland Barthes. Um, so, how, how is LARP, in a way, fulfilling some of the work of the, the post-structuralists, um, the, the work of the, the, the early four founders of media studies? Um, you know, our, our media train, our, our, train us in directing our attention. Um, 
And the question we ask again and again, is our attention being trained up towards authority or is it being trained around towards each other? And how do our, our media guide us in that training? Um, so quick uh, terms, you'll wanna know before we get to, too far into these mechanics, diegesis is the story world of a given piece of narrative media. You know, LARP is a, a gaming medium through which players can create diegeses or story worlds um, through two ways, acts that directly represent diegetic material and through gamified deployment of diegetic signifiers. So if you only have direct diegesis, you have immersive walkabout theater. You have to have some form of gamification of diegetic signifiers intermixed with your direct diegesis if you want to have a LARP on your hands. So the way different LARP communities gamify diegesis is uh, what's really a focus here. Um, so, so some of you might be familiar with uh, Barron's model of decentralized communication uh, from 1964. Um, you know, and that, that's sort of a model for thinking about how people's attention might be directed by a piece of media. Do you have an authorial media? So, you know, you know, author, authority, you know, very similar words there. Um, or do you have a, a more aggregate piece of media? The analogy for the authorial uh, media form, you know, the book. You have a, a centralized figure who's directing your imagination. You can't choose whether or not Huck Finn gets on that raft. Um, you know, there is an author, there is an authority over what is true in the narrative diegesis. Um, in a more aggregate piece of media, you have uh, a degree to which those who may be considered um, spectators have control over whether that thing gets on that raft. Um, an analogy for, you know, an, an aggregate piece of media, for LARP anyway, I'd say it's like a combination, if you, if you have aggregate LARP going on, You've got a combination between social media and open source software as, as analogies, depending on what you've rendered aggregate as part of your LARP. Um, so, you know, authorial LARP, it's more centralized. Players are looking towards a the director. They're like, what is my character thinking? You know, and I, I want to make sure folks know I'm not knocking authorial LARP. I, I really value that we have that experience. But, like, you are looking towards an authority to direct your play. Uh, LARP makers tend to focus, uh, it's the default for Western culture. You don't need to build new social apparatuses to teach people to stare at one person in the center of a room <laughs> full of people. How funny that we none of us had to do any special training to have this interaction that we're having right now. However, with an aggregate LARP, special apparatuses need to be built. They need to be workshopped. People have to figure out how to not look towards the central authority to, to get story in it, you know, and, and so that, that's why I say, like at the bottom, it, you know, you can hold the power over the diegesis of the royal, or you can fill the apparatuses to render it aggregate. You have to render it aggregate, you know, it's not, it's not automatic. Um, let me see. So, uh, to jump right into the mechanics, um, we are going to look real quick at um, Pacific Northwest Aggregate LARP. I, I spoke about it during the Boston LARP panel I was on earlier. I got to do some rules design for uh, um, Beyond the Ether uh, during the run of that game, which was one of a couple um, aggregate style LARPs that emerged in that area at that time. We look at Freeform, we look at Irvine style. Um, a, a, a rules engineer for that is, is here. Uh, yay, Evan. Um, I, I, I really want to, you know, uh, hear from you if we have time at the end um, during the Q&A. Um, but let me see, so rules and content aggregation. So I feel like I'm going to like go back and forth with my slides. <coughs> yes, photos, okay. I, I Yes. Um, so Pacific Northwest Aggregate LARP, um, I'm going to summarize it real quickly, especially for folks who were in the panel earlier. Um, so in diegetic commodity LARPs, um, don't have time to really jump into that term. Into LARPs where you have big books of rules that you've got to memorize, where before you even get out and can start co-creating diegesis, you need to know what a, a fireball is and know what to do if someone says like 20 agony and throws a, a beanbag at you and it hits you. Like you have to have that all memorized, like front loaded, you know, before you're even out on the floor co-creating diegesis. So diegetic commodity LARP. Um, there is a um, sort of tradition from the 80s of having, you know, these um, 
sort of centralized committees, um, many of whom are located in New England, um, oddly enough, that will create and license rules that are used all over the country. Um, I was part of a, a uh, of alliance LARP in the early 2000s, and we, you know, were a franchise that licensed the rules from the Alliance HQ out here in Boston. And uh, there's this interesting phenomenon where, with this style of LARP, you know, <coughs> diegetic commodities do render diegesis uh, very aggregate, very much uh, democratize it, decentralize it. Players are able to wander around without a GM and co-create story together. I can uh, heal you or uh, cast a dragon's breath or, um, you know, do some magic spell on you, you know, you, using this big set of rules. So it, it seems really, um, you know, uh, flat structure, non-hierarchical at first, but as you start playing these games, you realize, wait, who's making these rules? Where are these decisions coming from? Oh my gosh, if we want to change one rule in our chapter, it takes like four years of going through this really, yeah, how yeah, you know, it's really expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. No, it's not. Um, so, well, the, uh, the tactic, the, um, you know, I, I think based on many years of um, some members of that community in the Pacific Northwest being fed up, um, uh, new new forms of, of LARP were created. Um, embodied in Devia, 2009 was when that was launched, and Beyond the Ether, 2012 through 14. So this this style of game, Pacific Northwest aggregate LARPs, some some you know key things about them um, were that I'd say that the big change we made was that we let the players design the rules. The rule books suddenly went from being 250 pages to being these, like, 13 pages, 28 pages. That's, that's how long the rule books, the core rules were for these games. Like, uh, Brian Gregory came up with the, like, if you've ever done Ruby on Rails, you'll know the, uh, they have these, uh, what are the conventions? Uh, um, oh, I'm trying to, methodologies, you know, and the coding methodology for this is separate core rules from setting. You, you want your core rule book to, um, to be separate, and it's, um, it's amazing how when you make that design choice, you know, to say, all right, we're going to have a core rule book, and this rule book, rather than telling people what the rules are supposed to be, we let players create the rules. Suddenly, you know, if I want to have a character who's a magician, you know, it's like, all right, here's like the half page about what it means to um, create a rule that, um, that, that has a beanbag throw. So I can say, I want a rule where I turn people into rabbits. And um, they'll, they'll work with staff to create that rule. And you have um, a sort of, you know, democratic sense of every member of the LARP being able to come up with rules that are specific to their characters that work in a way that everyone can understand. Um, so that was like one of the many <coughs> changes we made to sort of democratize the process of being in a diegetic commodities, um, commodity LARP. Uh, you know, we also had an end point for those games to avoid the hierarchies that can be established. There's another major problem of this style of LARP is you do get um, levels of hierarchy in which players who have been playing for eight years um, can run around and you know fight big monsters and players who haven't been are dependent on them for, for protection and we wanted to avoid that way of centralizing story and of centralizing what happens in the game um, so creating a, uh, a a scenario where after one year you um, you end the diegesis completely. It's it's gone. Um, sort of eliminates that that hierarchy. So you prepare everyone. You say, all right, you know, this game ends after a year. Um, so these were you know design choices that allowed a, a a different player interaction with diegesis and uh, decentralized it in a way. Um, so narrative consensus. So. Transitioning to like a very, very, very different style of, of gamifying co-creative play. So say you're not in a diegetic quantity LARP. Say you 
are in, you, you're in a Nordic free form, but you know, I was having some conversations with people this weekend about other forms of cooperative and consensus-based LARPs that have, have emerged, you know, and um, kind of outside of this context, but um, the, the Nordic free form narrative consensus um, mechanics, um, essentially you're, you're pausing the game um, and having your players reach consensus about what happens next and then resuming the game to act it out. Um, you know, you, you don't really have diegetic commodities. Nothing happens to your character that you didn't consent to um, or that you don't consent to throughout the game. So you, you might decide before the game what you want to have happen or, you know, the, the goal is to, to work to co-create a story with with other characters. So you're you're going to have um, sort of a front loading of workshops on consent and consensus, so that you're you're prepared to be in a, a non-competitive mindset, so that you're you're ready to have this sort of um, engagement with a character uh, based on a term that comes from Swedish art making called in lapse, where you're sort of psychological and emotional experience of the character is, is privileged above all else. So I'm approaching that game, you know, rather than from a competitive mindset, from, from a mindset of, of consent and saying, you know, you know I, I'm gonna have, have this character go through an arc. Um, I'm gonna design all of the ups and downs that that character is gonna feel and everything that happens to my character in that game, every last thing, is going to be something I want to happen. And they have sets of mechanics to make sure that that, that occurs. Um, one of the main ones is pausing the game to, to work out as a group what is supposed to happen next. Um, and, and one of them is sort of throwing ideas out of character and modifying them um, based, on, based on each other's reactions. Um, so New World Magic Skola is a, a Nordic Preform LARP that has um, uh, transplanted some of these concepts, uh, to, uh, brought them to the United States, and what's been interesting in, in Maury Brown's writings about her work um, or running uh, New World Magic School Games is that there, there it is a level of, um, of consent uh, process and um, training that has to be workshopped. Um, and calibration that, that players have to learn um, in the United States that isn't present in the places these games originated. Um, or that the learning isn't present. Let's see, the culture is, is present. People already kind of know how to have these, these interactions in, in a way that, um, that they, they, they didn't in the US. So there's been a lot of work in building the mechanics to help help create this, this style of, of gamifying the diegesis. Um, and so there, you know, there's an, an eight page um, code of conduct policy um, for this, this game, which is very neat, but that's sort of one of the, almost like a rule book in a way, because you, once you have a firm code of conduct and players feel safe um, from you know, types of problematic behaviors and they understand that they can set their boundaries, you know, and they, they understand that, you know, they're, they're building their character's story in a certain way. Once, um, once they, they realize where they can set their boundaries, they're able to go a lot further into um, what it is that their character is, is supposed to do in the game. Um, so very quick gameplay example uh, to give you an idea of, of what this might look like. Um, so let's say there's just been a werewolf attack in the school halls. A player is lying on the ground and appears to be injured. Another player approaches and they, they have an out of game conversation. So the first thing that, you know, um, player number one, number one says, you know, they'll, they'll say off game. Uh, uh, so can I, can I see any injuries on you? And the other, or player two, so two, just might say, uh, yes, there's a, a big bloody giant scratch and it seems to be glowing with green light. Number one, well, my character wants to be a healer and she's really anxious about doing things right, but I want her to mess up. Uh, so would it be okay if she tries to heal you and just really screws it up? And number two might be, oh my gosh, that's perfect.
perfect. Okay, I, I really want to try playing with an impairment. So how will you heal me and I lose my voice? And number one might say, oh my gosh, I like that idea. But wait, what if instead you can't see? So other players have to guide you around. Um, number two, um, that, that, that wouldn't be fun for me. Uh, I, I think I just want to lose my voice. Uh, number one, gosh, I, I like this plan. So they, they, they've established a plan off game. And once, once it's established, they'll go back into character. They've got their magic wands and, uh, and the healing happens. Um, so that's sort of looking at, at that mechanic and how it looks. Um, diegetic bartering and randomization. Um, this is a technique developed in the Irvine Gemma Square community. Um, I was very excited to encounter it um, two years ago at the, the LA Freeform Society, um, where, where Evan Schoer brought that um, as one of our monthly, uh, monthly game jams. Um, and this, this technique, um, you, you have diegetic bartering randomization techniques uh, replacing the role of GM. So it's based on, I believe, the, uh, the indie LARP maker John Wick, who developed a tabletop GMless LARP that has somewhat similar mechanics and diegetic feel to it. Um, it creates a type of decentralized secrets and powers LARP, um, or parlor LARP. Um, yeah, no diegetic quantities in this game. Um, the, the examples, Port of Secrets and, and Blood and Tears, those are the, uh, the, the, the two pieces you really want to look at if you want to learn this rule system. And Evan is going to be running um, Port of Secrets uh, Saturday night at 10. Um, so, you know, this, this style of game, you know, I, I'd say it feels like playing poker with the diegesis. And it can feel really weird. Um, I'd say that you know there's there's pitfalls in every every type of game. And the the pitfall to watch out for with this is like diegetic instability vertigo, the sense where you're like, okay, so I walked into this game playing this police officer, and the mobster I was after just transformed me into his mother, and now like I just had my backstory changed again, and that person, you know, it's like all of these things about the game can change really randomly based on like how players leverage a type of power that, that they gamble with. So everyone starts out with an equal number of chips and you can bribe people into changing the dead uses and if they don't accept your bribe, there's a, uh, a, a competition mechanic that, that might let you, um, might let you uh, uh, make the diegetic thing that you want to have happen happen to the other person and it's it's involving dice you know so it's not skill based it's just very easy for anyone who you know may not have the the hand eye coordination you know to uh throw a diegetic commodity out there um but it's yet another exciting way of decentralizing the diegesis here's some photos from the, the run you know it, it lasted a good three hours and um uh you know it the character information, two pages, character sheets were this long, like pickup time for this LARP was literally 20 minutes. It was, it was amazing to get into a game where I'd say all players felt equally confident to co-create diegesis um, within about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so, um, my um, quick, you know, uh, I, I guess, uh, to, to sort of pull together, if, if, if one is preparing to create an academic uh, syllabus of, of LARP studies, or you're teaching LARP as literature, which I'm, I'm really excited to do in the future, um, I would say that if, if you want to teach a decision-making structure that mirrors socialism, um, teach diegetic commodities LARP, you know, and, and teach the standard style, and also, you know, show off Pacific Northwest Agri LARP, show off types of LARP that localize those structures. If you, you know, want to teach consensus process like anarcho-syndicalism, the way things are in Basque Country, you know, the Mondragon cooperative, like worker ownership, you know, what does that look like? How does it feel to be in a situation where you have no tyranny of the majority, where one person can block the entire group from doing something? You know, give Nordic Freeform Lab a try, give Narrative Consensus a try, and 
teach it to your students and you know pull that in with readings and um, and whatnot about that style. Um, Irvine Giemless LARP, I'd say it mirrors parts of capitalism. Uh, the narrative you were counting on could go bust at any moment and it it's the LARP that I've encountered so far that kind of like in, engages some of those some of those political economic mechanisms. Um, you know, game designer perks, um, dietetic commodities LARPs will let you hunt people, the other two won't. Narrative consensus, uh, you get the in lapse, the emotional connection, diegetic artery, <coughs> you get impromptu theater prompts. These are the things that each type of LARP gives you that the others don't. Um, I would argue that maybe, you know, maybe that's not the case, but um, you know, I, I, but I, I, I'd like to discuss that through um, uh, during the Q&A. But to, to get these features all with relative autonomy from the game staff, this took amazing effort on the parts of LARP maker to, makers to, to render these styles of games aggregate. Um, so I'm just very impressed with their work. I'd say the I'm just gonna uh, so the, the so I'm I'm of the belief that um, game literacy is a a vital feature for a well-functioning democracy. I'm excited to see a student population that encounters more rule sets and learns how to talk about and reflect upon those rule sets and how it made them feel to play that type of game. Um, so I look forward to a more advanced LARP studies curriculum and in future academic courses.